The Monkees didn't do too badly for themselves, given that they were created as a TV sitcom response to the Beatles. But the Monkees haven't always been blessed with good fortune despite their celebrity. Here's the tragic, real-life story of the Monkees. The success of the Beatles movies A Hard Day's Night and Help inspired a group of TV producers to do something similar with an American sitcom. That's how the Monkees were born. The members didn't come together the way bands traditionally do. They auditioned and were selected, not especially for their musical talent, but for TV-friendly qualities like charisma, good looks, and acting skills. Yet band members Michael Naismith and Peter Tork were accomplished musicians, and Mickey Dolenz and Davy Jones also had decent musical chops. The show was conceived like any sitcom. The actors would play characters, and the music was to be strictly pre-recorded, with the band only providing vocals. After the band released its first single and played a few shows, it became clear that they were more than just actors. Even so, the Monkees were never able to shake their less-than-iconic origin story. They became fairly universally known as the Prefab Four, a play on the Beatles' nickname the Fab Four. In January 1967, Peter Tork and Michael Naismith were upset when they listened to their second album, More of the Monkees, and discovered that it was nothing but recycled music from the show. According to AllMusic, the group finally decided to take a stand, demanding creative control. The Monkees were enough of a sensation that the producers couldn't just fire them and replace them with more agreeable performers. So they capitulated, fired the show's music coordinator, and the Monkees finally became the real band that critics had for so long accused them of not being. Creative freedom also meant freedom to disagree, and the band's autonomy also ended up showcasing creative differences. Their third and fourth albums were commercial and artistic successes, but the fifth, The Birds, The Bees, and The Monkees, was starting to feel a little disjointed. Also around that time, the television series was cancelled. The band wasn't happy with the sitcom format and thought it should be more of a variety show. The network, in turn, decided to just axe the whole thing. Success in music depends a lot on the preferences of your audience. Success in movies depends on other factors, such as screenwriting, plot, and making enough sense to avoid turning off your fanbase. The Monkees' 1968 feature film, Head, failed on pretty much all of those points. According to Night Flight, Jack Nicholson wrote the screenplay, but even that didn't do much to recommend it, because Nicholson was a B-movie actor no one had ever heard of at the time. The band brainstormed the film while high at a party. Then, Nicholson strung the ideas together into a screenplay while on LSD. The finished movie was a weird, plotless, disjointed commentary on everything from consumerism to media deception to police brutality to the exploitation of tragedy. It was also a self-deprecating jab at the monkeys themselves. It was poorly advertised, audiences that did see it were confused, and it was a flop. Of course, Head is now a cult favorite and is mostly well-liked by modern critics, but it was both the beginning and end of the Monkees' film career. Peter Tork seemed especially deflated by the failure of Head. In a 2011 interview with The Guardian, he said, "...the simile of a rock in the water is too mild for how badly that movie did." Tork soon left the band. The three remaining members stuck it out for another couple albums, but failed to generate any new hits. According to AllMusic, toward the end of 1969, Naismith called it quits, too. He'd already released a solo album and wanted to go it alone. Jones and Dolenz recorded a final album, but the two-man version of The Monkees was not what the band had once been. The band officially broke up after that 1970 album. The Monkees ended not with a bang, but a fizzle. Peter quit in it first, Mike quit second, Davey and I just kept going until nobody offered us any more money. After the Monkees broke up, Peter Tork formed a band called Release, which ironically dissolved before it was able to release a single record. He also attempted to start a production company, but No Trouble reported that enterprise also went nowhere. Tork struggled throughout the 1970s. His money ran out, he was forced to rent his home to a friend to avoid foreclosure, and he ended up moving with his pregnant girlfriend into the basement of David Crosby of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. He was also arrested for possession of hashish and had to spend three months in an Oklahoma penitentiary. Tork eventually moved away from the music industry altogether. He took a job teaching high school classes and coaching baseball. Ultimately, he had difficulty with the structure of the school system and was fired. Fortunately, Tork was able to turn things around when he quit drinking in the early 80s. He stopped taking drugs not long after that and was finally able to revitalize his music career. But it was a long, hard road to get there. Most Americans go out of their way to make sure they never, ever have to deal with the IRS apart from sending them a tax return on April 15th. But Michael Naismith ended up spending a lot more time with the agency than he wanted, 
In his 2017 memoir, he wrote that the dissolution of the monkeys was followed almost immediately by the descent of the tax man. He wrote, The IRS showed up with a huge bill for unpaid taxes and started seizing property. After his whirlwind rise to fame, he was pretty much left with nothing to show for it. After the IRS took all his stuff, Naismith's marriage collapsed and he dealt with the emotional blow in the most toxic way possible. He had an affair with the wife of a friend. In his memoir, he lamented that he was basically at a career and personal rock bottom. I had no opportunities as an actor, a player, a singer, a songwriter, or a producer. It wasn't all bad for Naismith, though. Not only was he heir to the liquid paper fortune, he literally was the creator of MTV. Mickey Dolenz also spent a lot of years doing not very much of anything. For a while, his resume's main selling point was not his success as an actor, which predated the Monkees by nearly a decade, or his vocal talents, it was that he was one of the Monkees. That notoriety earned him some small television roles and a few voice acting credits on cartoons like Scooby-Doo and Captain Caveman. At one time, he was neck and neck with Henry Winkler for the role of Fonzie on Happy Days, but that opportunity also passed him by. He told Guitar World, I remember when Henry first walked into the interview. He saw me and said, Oh crap, Mickey Dolenz is here, I'll never get it. But I'm so glad he did because he was a much better Fonz than I would have been. Dolenz didn't flounder for long. By 1976, he was headed to the UK to star in a musical, and plans to stay for three months eventually morphed into a 12-year career as a director and producer. With the power of MTV and with help from others in their orbit, Dolenz, Jones, and Torque got together for a 20th anniversary Monkees reunion tour in 1986 that exploded into an unexpectedly huge hit. By the 1990s, the former Monkees were all off doing their own things, but the 30th anniversary was approaching. According to All Music, the band got together to talk about the impending anniversary, discovered they still had some musical chemistry, and recorded a new album. The 1996 album Justice became the first Monkees record written and produced entirely by Naismith, Torque, Jones, and Dolenz. When the band decided to start touring again, all of their creative differences and personal animosity started to resurface. Naismith dropped out of the tour early on, and the remaining band members weren't quiet about how that made them feel. The remaining three toured again in 2001, but this time it was Torque who abandoned ship, although Jones and Dolenz said they fired him. Torque later complained that Jones and Dolenz drank so much on the tour that they became mean and abusive. But it wasn't just Torque clashing with Jones and Dolenz. Evidently, Jones and Dolenz weren't getting along swimmingly either. In a 2009 interview, Jones said he couldn't imagine sharing a stage with Mickey Dolenz ever again. Ouch. Things weren't going awesomely for Michael Naismith either. In 2010, Naismith's wife left him, and in the middle of all of that emotional turmoil, he started to go blind. Naismith wrote in his 2017 memoir Infinite Tuesday, an autobiographical riff, I lost my sight to cataracts and at the same time lost my flexibility to an undiagnosed condition that crippled me, making it difficult and painful to walk. I was essentially helpless, a captive in my home. Fortunately, Naismith's blindness was reversible. Cataract surgery restored his sight, but his strange crippling illness was more difficult to overcome because no one knew what it was. The illness left him largely unable to use his left hand, and his right foot was useless enough that he had to drag it when he walked. The specialists he visited mostly just scratched their heads and offered him pain medication. The good news is that the illness, whatever it was, eventually went away on its own. Naismith, a Christian scientist, believes prayer and medication cured him. The Monkees got together once again in 2011 and went on tour only without Michael Naismith, who by then had inherited his liquid paper fortune. The 45th anniversary tour actually went shockingly well for rockers, clearly past their prime. Though after a summer of traveling around North America, the band members, who were all well into their 60s, chose not to add more dates to the tour. Then in February of the following year, Davy Jones died of a heart attack. Jones's death shocked everyone who knew him. A business associate told CNN he was a vegetarian and there was not an ounce of fat on the guy. He lived on the beach in Florida and ran miles every morning. He couldn't have been in better shape. That, finally, was the end of the Monkees as a foursome, but Michael Naismith joined the remaining two Monkees for a short set of reunion performances, each of which featured a tribute to their fallen bandmate. In February 2019, the Monkees took their most recent blow. Peter Tork finally succumbed to the rare form of head and neck cancer he'd been battling for a decade. Torque was first diagnosed with adenoid cystic carcinoma in 2009. Two years later, he told Rolling Stone that the surgery he'd undergone to remove the cancer had been a success. He wrote, My checkups have been clear ever since. I'm excruciatingly lucky. 
I count my blessings every day. Cancer doctors will always hesitate to say cancer is cured, and for good reason. It can come back even years after it's disappeared, and when it does, it's often resistant to the treatments that took it down the first time. After Torque's death, the two remaining monkeys posted heartfelt messages in their bandmates' honor. Naismith was especially profound. He wrote, It's going to be a rough day. I share with all Monkeys fans this change, this loss. Even so, PT will be a part of me forever. And the Monkeys will be part of us. Check out one of our newest videos right here, plus even more grunge videos about the Monkeys are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.